important that we to critically review the specific impact of COVID uh, on the women and our youth to enable the development of um, response measures that avoid widening existing inequality. So this panel will really discuss the impact of COVID-19 on uh, young, on the youth and the women and identify the measure to avoid the widening inequalities. Uh, first of all, let me, before we get started, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to this esteemed panel that I have here with me. First of all, I'm going to start with Eunice Baguma Ball. I hope I say your name correctly. And she's a founder of Africa Technology Network, the Technology Business Network, and is passionate about female entrepreneurship and digital innovation in Africa. Second, I have Dr. Erin Uchono Menya, did I say that right? <laughs> I hope I didn't put your name, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, and uh, so she's a director of the AIMS teacher training program for the um, AIMS Global Network. And also I do have Dr. David Jang, uh, Mr. David Jang, he's a founder as uh, Bliss Executive of Social Enterprise Management uh, Consulting that is geared uh, towards helping small business in Africa. Welcome to all of you guys. Um, do, I have Dr. Dr. do I have Foster as well? Um, I could say I can say Foster on the chat feed. So I don't know whether it's just about getting into the room because I can see he has he chatted two minutes ago. That's right. So maybe he will join us very soon. But uh, hopefully he will he will be here. So, but let's get started. I'm going to start with you, um, uh, Eunice, if you do not mind. Um, so what I have um, right now, you know, just trying to figure out based on what I just said, how is COVID-19 rolling back the gains on women's social economic empowerment? And what measure do you think could be adopted to prevent that domestic violence that we see uh, in the, in the women, especially in the rural areas. Thank you, there for the uh, introduction and, and welcome to my fellow panelists. So, like you said in my introduction, my work focuses around digital entrepreneurship, digital innovation. So, I'll kind of be commenting from that perspective. And where I see um, the impact of COVID has really done damage and started to roll back some of the gains that we've made is around, you know, when you look at, um, you know, sort of the, the impact on, you know, domestic roles and, and distribution. So a lot of more women's work was interrupted by the pandemic. Uh, women had to, you know, a lot of the time, so that not even in my family, had to take on the role of staying at home to either homeschool or look after their kids. Um, and you can, as you can imagine, uh, this has impacted work, uh, women's work, women's opportunities. I remember reading a research that a study that said actually the number of of, of, of papers and, and papers being uh, sent in by female researchers had drastically dropped compared to male uh, researchers during this time. So it's really hard. I'm sure we will continue to really start to see what the effects are years from now. I think even what, what we're seeing right now is kind of more some of the symptoms, but I think the scale of this impact, uh, both or, you know, economically, socially, will, be, will, will continue to, to, to come to light. Um, mm -hmm. On the second side, when I look at it from the digital perspective, when you look at digital skills, digital skills gaps, so currently in Africa, we have one of the biggest digital gender divides. So the difference between women and girls being able to have access to digital skills and participate in kind of digital um, activities. And you look at it from the perspective of the pandemic, you can see that because of a lot of disruption between business, so maybe if your business was relying on footfall, people passing by your shop, you had to quickly adapt uh, to be able to sell your products online. People have talked about having to learn how to use paid promotions say on Facebook or to set up a website or to be able to um, deliver, take orders and deliver. And so if you if existing digital gaps means that women are less likely to be able to take up these opportunities to actually be able to help their businesses to survive this difficult time. So it just goes to show that these existing gaps have now kind of, you know, been exacerbated and brought to light by uh, the, the current situation. Uh, and lastly, when you look at, uh, at the digital economy as a sector, the fact that it's it's kind of where work is moving towards, it's where a lot of opportunities are coming are coming up. There are also the more higher paid opportunities. 
So the impacts of that are actually twofold. One is that, you know, for a long time, women have been more, you know, socialized towards, um, you know, sectors like, you know, hospitality, care, you know, sort of a, a few of the lower paying sectors. And these have been, A, the hardest hit. They are less flexible, so it's much more difficult for you to work from home. So they're going out to do the care work and the nursing, and they're getting much more exposed. It's much, if you are a computer programmer, you can very easily sort of work from home. So there is that, there's that perspective on it. And then there's also the perspective, apart from the exposure, that the fact that you're probably in the lower paying roles means that when it comes to deciding as a family, even when there's no, you know, gender roles aside, deciding as a family who should stop work and maybe stay at home and look after the kids and who should continue working, because you're earning less, it's probably more likely for the women to do that. So I think you know, and, and you can see how a lot of these things are then interconnected with, you know, with economic economic gaps, education gaps. You know, why don't women have the digital skills because of the different education opportunities? So I think we are really seeing an intersection of very many different, you know, uh, infrastructure, cultural, uh, and economic issues that have just come together in this pressure cooker that's the, the pandemic. And it's really, as you're saying, we're going to move the conversation to how do we respond, um, but it's really, really a challenge right now. Absolutely. Um, and thank you so much, Eunice, and especially the digital gap that you have talked about. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable um, how the women are falling back. Um, so thank you for that. Let me just get to Dr. Uh, Perino. Um, you know, according to the UNESCO in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's about 89% of learners do not have access to the household computers and about 82% lack access to, uh, to internet. I was just wondering, you know, like with the work that AIMS is doing, uh, what opportunity do you see for this organization to partner with other organizations to increase access to education for girls and boys forced to stay in rural areas during the COVID-19? Thank you, Ne. Um, it's my pleasure to be here, and thank you, everybody, for joining and the fellow panelists. I think the, the issues uh, touching on education are very close to what um, has just been outlined by the first panelist. And as she said towards the end, when she was, uh, she was ending, she's talked about an intersection of so many things that have uh, been put, uh, I mean, exposed more because of the pandemic. And one of the things that you, um, is obviously an issue and is uh, of concern and a focus to many people is the availability of uh, the infrastructural tools that uh, students would need to learn in the new normal that has been created by the COVID-19. So there's a lot of conversation around um, how do we ensure that access uh, is enhanced um, during this time um, and during the uh, COVID-19 uh, school instigated uh, school breaks. Uh, many, uh, good enough, many countries are beginning to open back the school and get back the students back to physical learning. But even that is still not very um, solid. There is a lot of uncertainty that is still uh, surrounding the opening of school. And so there's a little, uh, there's still a, a lot of reliance on tapping into the um, ICT and digital infrastructure to do that. And the question here, uh, when we think about it, um, COVID-19 has kind of put an additional layer in terms of the gender uh, the gender inequalities when it comes to edu uh, education. And in this case, for us as an institution, African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, we're very keen about mathematics and sciences. And uh, so we're very keen to look at what does it mean to um, facilitate, to foster, and to work with the uh, stakeholders, to think through a number of factors, one of them of being infrastructure, but the other thing, which is um, actually the, the biggest thing that uh, I believe we have to all look into because um, technology does not equal learning. So there's always been a conversation about what should come first. Should it be the pedagogy or should it be technology or how do we work closely with um, consciousness of both? Because I think there was a sense that um, many of us or we were forced to very quickly think about the technology and the different gadgets and the different platforms and the different tools. And that was good to try and ensure there was still conversation going on around uh, education. And we know, especially for uh, scientists, that even before COVID, um, there's, uh, we would say there was um, segregation in terms of curricular areas. We tend to say that the girls tend to do better in their reading and the literacy. And then there's a little bit of a gap in most areas when it comes to sciences. Of course, it's not um, equal in all areas. 
So as an institution in, during this break, I did a teacher training program in Rwanda. And one of the things that happened was that even in terms of training the teachers, our interventions were interrupted because of COVID before we, you know, what we want, I mean, we largely did. But we also, I mean, when I talk about COVID, I, I talk about the challenges, but I also talk about, I mean, I also celebrate the opportunities that yeah. came with COVID. The things that uh, because of COVID we've been forced to think about and actually they are actually strengths or in, a boost in the arm for us. So I think for us, in addition to talking about infrastructure, talking about access to digital tools, one of the things that we're keen about as an institution is how to amplify the conversation around the reimagining pedagogy. How should pedagogy look like in the situation, in the new normal of um, COVID-19? We are talking about either students learning at home using whichever ICT platform we're talking about, or students have gone back home gone back to school and they, are, they find themselves in a new setup where teachers have masks on, teachers can't closely interact with the students, students are supposed to keep their social distance and they're supposed to mask themselves throughout. So the big question is, what does this have in learning and learning in our case in terms of maths and sciences? And that's part of where we really see ourselves positioning ourselves to add value to the conversation, especially in the African context. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. It's it's really really very important, you know, that amplifying and also like okay, how do we how do we start the conversation? I mean, I think it's wonderful that we're getting the teachers ready, but also how do we all work together and get you know the student also be ready for the post COVID because that will be this will be over someday. Like, how do we prepare our student for that? So that's that's really wonderful. Thank you for that. I would like to acknowledge the Foster. Can you hear us? Oh, you are on mute. Sorry. <laughs> uh, apologies, I had issues logging in, but I'm glad to be here now. That's okay. We're happy to have you here. And also, I would like to tell the audience, you know, please feel free to ask any question you have via the chat. I'll make sure that also that we all engage you as well. Um, so let me ask David, um, you know, in Gambia, I understand there have been a lot of work in been done. Australia, or... Can you hear me? Uh, okay, hello, so... can, can you hear me? Dai, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I can hear you, David. Dai. Yes. Dai. Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we yes, can. I can. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, we can. I think, uh, David. Uh, okay, David is having some challenge. Okay, so that's that's fine. I'm sure he'll be back. Let me get back to uh, to Foster then. Um, you know, based on what Dr. Herino uh, just said, um, what opportunities do you see? You know, around this, um, you know, like getting children ready, the youth and women ready for the post-COVID. Um, what do you see the opportunity for the existing? existing businesses ready to take the measures that will ensure that our youth in Africa have access to the educational necessity uh, so that they can thrive today and, uh, and, and tomorrow. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think, you know, COVID will, will, will end, you know, the, the post-COVID era would come, fortunately, mm -hmm. sooner than we think. Mm -hmm. uh, but education and learning will remain what they are. You know, that's not going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, what COVID did was change the way we we implement, administer, provide, you know, uh, education and learning. Uh, so going forward, my take is that um, we need to, and we all know within, within Africa that we, we have some issues with uh, the implementation of, you know, education and, and provision of, of learning. So going forward, I think the opportunity is, you know, that, um, well, technology aside, because I've heard this talked about quite a lot, and I agree that technology is, is just a tool. Uh, but I think we we should be back to the, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to actually fix, you know, the fundamentals that, that, that were sort of wrong with our educational system, because what COVID has done really is to expose, you know, the, the fundamentals that were wrong already. <laughs> Uh, and that these fundamentals include the, 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 the nature of, of curriculum uh, and, and, and the quality of education. 
So my take is that yes, we should continue to encourage we should continue to encourage access to education, which is what technology does, basically, that children can still learn, the young and the youth can still learn, you know, irrespective of the lockdown. So that's access. But at the same time, we have an opportunity to look at issues of quality and particularly relevance, uh, because these are two issues, relevance of education. These are two issues that we have sort of ignored for a long time. And I see the, the opportunity for for our, our young people not only to be uh, recipients of, of, of the new normal, but also being part of creating that new normal mm -hmm. uh, in terms of creating the, the, the technological opportunities, innovation to creating the new ways, you know, that, uh, that, that we teach, we teach and learn. So for me, uh, COVID has number one exposed the, the weaknesses in our assistance, but also created the opportunity for us to reboot, uh, and going forward and look at how we can better use technologies that we have. Uh, not not waiting for for the five G or even even four G, you know, but the technologies that exist, and finding ways, you know, to redesign curriculum and to and to teach, you know, our our young people better, teach them in in ways that you know become make them more relevant and more productive uh, right. within the within the African economy. Right. Um that you 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 end up on a very important point. How do we make the curriculum more relevant? bring the quality and what is it that you know specifically that we could be done right now to be prepared you know for for tomorrow right um what do you see like uh, a work with maybe is, is it with the governments is it with all the private sector institutions what what do you think like, could be or is it like international um partnership? What do you what do you see? As a I, I, I think the, the, the tone needs to be set by policy at the end of the day, uh, yeah. because policy guides, you know, education development and delivery of education. So that that needs to be the, the main guide. Mm -hmm. So the the, uh, the policy makers in the continent, you know, who are responsible for education, for employment, for entrepreneurship, for innovation, you know, needs to need to ensure that you know the curriculum, yes, is is of high quality and deliverable, but at the same time, the content should be relevant to what the continent needs. Got it. You know, because uh, my, my experience and observation so far has been that we, we formulate policies sort of to, I mean, we all talk about the 21st century skills, you know, so we train in the, the young for, for the 21st century skills, but then we still have 20th century problems. <laughs> you know, and uh, I mean, if you have ever gone to a mechanic in any part of Africa or, or hired a carpenter, you realize the skills that we need for the 21st century. So mm -hmm. the point is that, you know, we need to be able to fix where we're coming from, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of the way that we train the youth and also to add on, you know, what is relevant for the continent and actually not maybe not even for the whole continent, but for each country, yes. you know, and, you know, to, to look at okay, what what do we need? Mm -hmm. And we, we, we know now with, 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 with COVID and with the disruptions in the, uh, in the global supply chain, you know, and, and the competent, we know what we need. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we know that, well, it's, it's, it may not be possible in situations like this to import what we need from wherever. So we need to be able to learn to make these things, you know. Yeah. So, so I think the curriculum should encourage a lot of knowing, which is traditional learning, mm -hmm. but we need to put in a lot of doing as well. You know that we teach these young people to be able to do, not yeah. just to know and understand. So that relevance comes in in terms of what is needed, what the market needs. And I'm not belittling the significance of training uh, our young to to chase the frontier of science. That that's fine. You know, we need more of them to be chasing, you know, in biotechnology, you know, genetics, you know, to chase the frontier of science to do what is possible. But I think we should also mm -hmm. encourage them to do what is needed you know, right. to solve the problems that we are in today in terms of relevance. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. I think it's a very good point, you know, about what is needed and every country is different. So it's like has to be tailored on a country by country basis. Uh, on that point, let me get to David. Uh, welcome back. Can you hear us now? Thank you. Yes, I can hear you. So David, um, I just would like to get your thought around what uh, Foster just said, you know, around in Gambia, you know, what effort has been done so far and is there anything that could uh, that you learn that could be shared, you know, uh, across um, the continent as well. It sounds like you had some very successful um, outcome. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much. In in Gambia, 
um, realize that um, a private sector plays a key role in, in every situation that the country is facing. So um, we had efforts that have been led by the Gambia Chamber of Commerce to raise funds um, to support COVID-19. We did that through a telethon and through members, and uh, we were able to raise about uh, more than uh, 400,000 400, uh, US dollars. And these efforts, um, we, we renovated the sanatorium, which served as the center. We also realized that there were also other vulnerable groups that actually um, were facing serious challenges like um, the prisoners. So we knew that the prisoners may not come in contact with people, but uh, they come in contact with prison officers. So due to that, um, we work with the UNDP to get um, a bus for prison officers which will transport them and ensure there is social distancing so that they are not infected with the virus uh, to be able to ensure that uh, the prisoners don't get infected. Other vulnerable groups like uh, persons with disability too, we, we looked at them because um, they're also being affected. So, so we looked at them to see how best we can support them um, with little packages that will be able to, you know, help them to, to stimulate them um, during this period because in most cases um, they have been ignored. You know, these are very key people that play a key role in our society that most of the time, you know, we don't look at them. And another thing that we realized was um, there's a switch, there's a loss in jobs in some aspects and there's a gain um, increase in, in jobs in other aspects. For example, if you look at uh, manufacturing, um, in not only in Gambia, but across Africa, manufacturing sector um, has been widely um, employing women and youth. And um, due to COVID also, it has been affecting uh, the manufacturing sector, the agricultural sector. But another sector that we see there's increase is the ICT sector uh, uh, because everybody is trying to live in the new normal where people are trying to uh, do business and trade online. So you see because of this, there are opportunities for young people that are in the ICT sector. But primarily the people that are also affected is the informal sector. Because mm -hmm. people who are employed in the formal sector will, will gain benefits, you know, you will gain social security benefits or other forms of benefits. But this doesn't come with the informal sector, even though, you, you know, those in the formal sector, you're not working, your salary keeps rolling. But the informal sector, if you stay at home during the lockdown, it affects you. And we need to understand that the market women are primarily mostly focused in the uh, informal sector and the youth. So mm -hmm. these sectors really have been hit badly. I think there's a huge need to really look at issues um, relating to bankruptcy. Because if you look at it, I can tell you there have been huge loss of jobs, um, not only in Gambia, but across the continent. And um, these loss of jobs, some businesses have gone bankrupt. So what policy measures um, can we put in place as a continent and as countries to ensure that we are addressing bankruptcy, we are addressing people to be able to get back to their jobs and, and, and get decent jobs to be able to help economies um, across the continent. And these um, and other efforts that the, the Gambia Chamber of Commerce, including other sector leaders, are really looking at in, in Gambia. Thank you, David, you know, and uh, congratulations on that effort, you know, and you are absolutely right around the, um, you know, the informal sector. A lot of women, a lot of, lot of youth in there. What can we do? What can we learn from COVID right now? And the gap that Foster had uh, mentioned, how can we leverage that to actually be prepared and, 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 and create opportunity for those because uh, the situation is really terrible for them. So thank you for sharing. Um, um, Eunice, I'm going to get back to you. And uh, you talked about the digital divide uh, among women. And I was just curious, like, what mitigation from your perspective and innovative recovery measures could be put in place to avoid the widening of those inequalities? Yeah, I think, uh, and again, just very good point uh, made uh, all around. Um, you know, from my perspective, I think one of the things that really needs to, to start happening is investing in digital skills. And I think right now, um, the, the conversation around including women in STEM has been more of how do we get women into technology fields. Um, mm -hmm. I think the conversation needs to shift towards how do we take technology to people. 
and to women and to you know, marginalized groups wherever they are. So, uh, you know, like David was talking, uh, uh, was was already has already mentioned a lot of women are already working in these informal sectors. How do we digitalize those sectors? Because I think a lot of the time the focus is how do we get women to be more into programming? How do we get them into you know this this tech field? But you know, we need to think about how do we get informal businesses people that are selling fruits in the market, people, how do we get them to actually have the digital skills to allow them to continue their business and to leverage digital skills to continue. So I think that, sh that shift towards making technology inclusive, taking technology to people, to, to sectors, you know, uh, increasing digitalization. I think, you know, the mobile phones were a start. You know, most people now have mobile phones. Most people are now using it for personal um for personal communication, for, you know, financial. Now we really need to make the shift in terms of towards for business and for work. I really mm -hmm. unlocking the potential of the power of what, what people have in their hands already, which are mobile phones, for education, for business, etc. So I think that shift, I think, you know, policy-wise will need to happen across, um, you know, things like incorporating digital curriculum, even in vocational schools, for example, um, uh, to really kind of make, uh, accelerate that, 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 that shift. Um, I think the other thing that needs to really happen is um, increasing, you know, making participation within the digital economy much more uh, inclusive. So again, tying into the additional skills, how do we tie those with the right support, whether it's around entrepreneurship, whether it's around careers, really. And I think there's also really need to be a, a shift around culture because I think it was uh, Dr. Irene who said, you know, we are talking to educators, we also need to talk to students. But, you know, on the other hand, we also need to talk to families because I think what happened is there was a drive around educate the girl child and the, the message was send her to school, right? So there was some protection, some protection that kind of availed to the girl child while she's at school. You know, she's not going to be interrupted, she's not going to be called to do house chores, etc. But now if, if learning is moving back into the home setting, how do we, how do we make that message that, you know, if she's now studying, don't say, oh, go and collect water versus your brother. Because this totally changes the dynamic. I think there was that protection of you went to school, you had to be there at a certain time. So maybe that time was kind of protected. But there's a, a colleague of mine who, who did some research into how girls use a, a, a mobile phone for, la for revision. And she said, you know, when they compared with boys and girls, girls struggled to use it simply because they had so many other responsibilities and chores at home. Yes. compared to boys who are not really able to make that shift. So at school, they were fine, they were peers, but at home, there's a difference. So I think now as part of that conversation and even around policy, the messaging, because I remember growing up seeing those messages around, you know, send girls to school. Now the messaging needs to be much more holistic of, you know, prioritize girls' education wherever it's happening, whether it's at home or at school. So I think some of those, those are some of the shifts I think that we need to see um, to start really incorporating uh, the new normal. And I really think it's, it starts from the grassroots with culture and really bringing the conversation uh, into, you know, into the societal uh, forefront. Yes. And I really love what you just said around, you know, um, shifting the culture. Uh, we have to really think differently. And how might we do that now that, you know, the education now is sh has shifted to home. Then I'm going to ask Dr. Herring, um what are your thoughts? I feel like, you know, maybe women really need to be empowered and be part of that conversation into policy shaping because they have like so much um, responsibility or even like leadership in their own home. So how might we invest in the leadership of women uh, and empower them to participate into and contribute to the design of those policy ma measures? Thank you. Um, and it's very... Um um, the insights coming from the various uh, panelists is really uh, building. And I think uh, your question about um, how is it that women can be part of the policy conversations. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use an example from our teacher training program. Um, so as I said, we, we, teach, we train teachers and during this COVID-19 break, we had to shift from uh, physical training to on, online training. And one of the things... Um, that was a, that's a key characteristic of a training program um, even before COVID was that uh, we always said uh, we do not work on teachers, we work with teachers. And so even before the COVID-19 outbreak, we had uh, 
champion teachers who we consulted every step of the way. There's no intervention that would come up with and want to implement without consulting the teachers, this group of champion teachers, having conversations with them, testing and hearing their feedback in terms of the feasibility, uh, the con uh, how relevant it is con uh, in terms contextually in terms of their classroom. And of course, taking into consideration that within Africa, uh, and perhaps even other countries, we tend to have different tiers of schools. We have schools that are more endowed with resources. We have other schools that really uh, ha have less resources and perhaps higher population. So it, that's something that 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 we built as a key characteristic of our of, uh, of our, our program. And ideally, uh, part uh, during the COVID nineteen break, as we shifted to online, we stood out as one of the programs that was able to continue in a very massive way even within such a short time. And what helped us was, again, that pool of teachers. We had like an army outside there who, um, for example, the first thing we had to do was to mobilize all the teachers and register them um, on WhatsApp groups. And we had 52 different WhatsApp groups to get these teachers on. And we couldn't handle it as a team in the office. The people who helped galvanize the fellow teachers and look for them and talk to them and get them online on to the WhatsApp groups were the fellows. Of working Africa risk capacity, I thank you also well uh, for, for being part of the panel. The, we don't work directly in in, in vaccine uh, distribution or the vaccine area, but of course, in our collaboration with the Africa CDC and also uh, with WHO and others, we are aware of the the continents uh, that the, the covered. Uh, group, uh, including um, Gavi and others, that are ensuring that. Um, there is access and equitable distribution of these vaccines when they come online uh, uh, for the continent. But from the public health side, there are a number of other factors that needs to be looked at. Um, production of, of these vaccines, cold chain uh, distribution of these vaccines, and also eventually we need to look at a patent release uh, for these vaccines uh, production in, in regions where the capacity uh, is um, and in, it could be in, in in certain parts of the continent in certain parts of of, of, of uh, uh, other areas. So cost is an issue that needs to be looked at. Um, I'm hearing co-payment and and placing of orders. So um, the vaccines are going to be in short supply. So uh, we need all to prime ourselves uh, to um, uh, respond to our frontline uh, staff and the most vulnerable first, perhaps uh, in 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 uh, the response that comes on. Thank you. Oh. So this is a nice segue to our, uh, oh, before that, I, I see Francesco, you have a comment, a response to that. And I just I just wanted to quickly say that uh, one, one final thing is, and this was mentioned in the video, and uh, and in part, um, Robert was talking about this right now, is that all of this, of course, there's an emphasis, there, and there should be an emphasis on a multidisciplinary work. And that's uh, kind of like the final thing that I wanted to say, that uh, ultimately, there, and it's something that we've learned with, with our work, but that um, in any, for example, vaccine allocation, one needs to talk to um, medical professionals, public health professionals, but also possibly um, people with behavioral psychology or game There's people who, that there, there are multiple other things that we've seen with this pandemic that uh, have completely opened our eyes to just simply for human behavior. Um, what do we do with people who don't want to take vaccines? What do we do, for example, as is the case in some places like Germany, where um, people might be apprehensive to take the vaccine, even, even though they're not necessarily anti-vaccine? And um, this idea that they approve of the vaccine, but just temporarily not for myself. And uh, these entire kind of game theoretic issues and strategic issues are also really important. And I, I just wanted to kind of quickly say before we move on and uh, that I think that what Ames is doing and what uh, everyone here is, is, is talking about is that this multidisciplinary approach is, is essential for such a wide problem like the pandemic. Thank you for that. So vaccine hesitancy is a real and broad topic, which I think deserves its own panel discussion at this point. Um, but um, addressing the, the flip side, which is uh, what are the healthcare systems capacities to actually even, um, um, you know, address the pandemic, not just from the vaccination angle, but vaccination diagnosis treatment. Um, I have a question for you, Dr. Robert, um, regarding um, what we have learned from COVID-19 and Ebola uh, responses, what do you think the government should put in place to ensure that the next pandemics don't cause the same level of shock to the system and, and the same level that, um, you know, um, the healthcare systems have actually been crippled by the response to both uh, pandemics? Okay, um, thank you again. Um, I think that first, 
the recognition that they are, we are dealing with different pathogens and 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 how they affect and you know, their behavior and how we respond to them are different uh, must be established. But um, during the Ebola crisis, I think we saw a bit more uh, unpreparedness and and weak uh, response in in the area of surveillance and and uh, lab testing and and things of that nature. There's been some improvement uh, in the 2018 uh, DRC, and also I think COVID has primed a lot of our governments uh, in, in responding much better to that. So there, there are a few lessons that, that have come up that we can pick up. But um, two areas that I think um, we must look at, or a few, I should say. One is the burden on, on, on health workers. I mean, um, during the Ebola crisis, uh, we, we had a lot of health workers that have, have and the same is occurring for this is is the stress, the trauma, um, and and the fact that health care systems are inundated with that. Another area that we tend not to focus on is is the secondary effects of uh, of, of of these. For example, during the Ebola crisis in 2014, we while we recorded around 11,300 thereabout deaths in uh, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, there were about 10,600 deaths. Uh, related to HIV and AIDS, TB, and malaria, um, and a, a similar uh, a, 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 um, a study that has been done recently is also showing that there are about 44 percent uh, of people are not having access to healthcare, and almost about 50 percent not accessing uh, medication. So the point being made here is that when we turn our attention to the problem at hand, we usually forget that there are other diseases, there are other issues that needs to be addressed and um, these are one of the key lessons that we must look at immunization suffers uh, maternal and child health issues uh, are not addressed so this is areas that governments can look into what are some of the recommendations i'll make this quick i mean a few one one is investment in health system and we we can get away from investing in the six pillars uh, of, of the of, of the um, the health system that the health strengthening system that has been put in place it is hard time that we stop flying to other countries when we have a problem either our leaders or those of us who can afford it africa needs to invest uh, in its human capacity in its infrastructure in vaccines and co we must also build and improve on our understanding of diseases that affect us infectious diseases uh, do some projections around them do some profiling and modeling around them so that we will be able to predict and prime ourselves to respond to this. All this takes investments and uh, the investments is governments must put a bit more into the, the healthcare as I've been promised from Abuja and other things. So these are some of the lessons that we can pick from the current uh, COVID crisis and, and some of the recommendations that we can better prepare ourselves so that we respond to next epidemic much better. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response. Um, so we have um, a question uh, which I will merge with another question. So in, in terms of achieving herd immunity, um, uh, so um, Professor Janine, I, I will direct the question to you. What do you think the epidemiological factors um, are to achieve uh, herd immunity, especially in places where herd immunity can't be achieved, for example, by mass vaccination because they're remote areas, they don't have um, vaccination programs in place. Um, how do you think we should address uh, the concept of herd immunity and how to measure it? What are the epidemiological factors that will contribute to it? Um, uh, can you give us some insight um, from your expertise in public health? Uh, thank you, Sora. Uh, yeah, I think this is a tough question. I was looking at it as well. Oh my goodness, this is really tough, especially when we can't hear you. Feet. Can you hear me now? Hello? Can you hear me now? It looks like you're speaking, but we can't hear you. Hello? Hello? All right. Hello? Um, while we resolve that technical issue in the background, um, so herd immunity, I mean, as an immunologist, I think about it probably very differently from public health modelers. Um, but I am interested in the health systems aspect of achieving um, uh, herd immunity, either by natural infection or vaccination. Um, so um, maybe I will direct the question actually to Francesco, if you want to give us some insight from mathematics and modeling on, um, um, you know, you, you, you spoke a little bit about the R factor um, and transmission. Um, so how can we 
you know, properly model herd immunity in a way that um, we can predict the outcomes based on um, natural infection and transmission or vaccination programs. Um, the question is from McGill University from Rhino uh, uh, Fugion. And um, I probably um, remixed the question a little bit, but uh, you get the main gist of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess from, um, so from the mathematical perspective to, to, to model herd immunity, um, the, the way that I've seen is just a, a, a clear definition of if a sufficient proportion of the population uh, can't contain or propagate the virus, then by natural probabilistic means, the virus will will die out on its own, or it simply will have difficulties in propagating. And I think that the the way that this can tie in to again surveillance, vaccination, and testing strategies is is precisely having this be an objective um, of obtaining um, and uh, of obtaining herd immunity amongst the population that is actually um, free to move. So, so I think here the the, the mathematical insight is to that that I would take as somebody who works more in operations research and and computer science. It would it would be to look at the list of uh, the space of mechanisms. What can we do? We can decide whom do we test. We can decide whom do we um, whom do we vaccinate, etc. And and ultimately compare this say via simulation um, on how um, the long term infection rates are of a given population. Um, and, and I think I also wanted to, it, it's important to tie this back. I think what, what, what Robert was saying a little while ago is ex incredibly important, which it might not necessarily be the key, the, the right objective might not necessarily be to um, achieve her, herd immunity, say, or reduce the R-naught value. Um, perhaps given all of these after effects or unintended consequences of the virus. And I think it's maybe important, um, and I, this perhaps comes after much time and repeated learnings, as maybe has been the case with uh, having to deal with Ebola and then COVID to, to for example, say, perhaps it's a, a, a toy example would be that rather than thinking about just the death rates that are attributable to COVID, that perhaps an objective might be to minimize hospital loads um, in o over a population. And the reason for this being that a higher hospital load has the unintended consequences in general of overly, of deaths beyond the baseline that would have happened for other diseases or for other health conditions, for maternal health, et cetera. And so, so this objective is it's it's subtle and and non-trivial and beyond that 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 of herd immunity. And and this is the very difficult question. But definitely, as computer scientists and mathematicians, we have no idea on how what what the right objective is. But we can at least um, start a conversation of thinking: Should we think about a broader objective that encompasses the 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 effects that that, that come from? Um, not just the virus throughout time, but also the implementation of solutions. And this is something that we've seen. I and mean, for example, we could just uh, isolate everyone and have everybody stay at home. And this, but this is, in certain places, has catastrophic consequences socioeconomically as well. And so I think that also um, we, they're, 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 we get this trade off of at what cost do we um, obtain uh, immunity? And uh, and I think. We, it, it's just important to maintain these trade-offs in, in the conversation too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So w as infectious disease scientists, we talk a lot about r not and the R-factor. Um, uh, would you like to explain what the terms mean? Uh, because I don't think they're actually very accessible to the public. So it's actually a, a very simple concept. Um, um, I wish Dr. Janine was able to speak, <laughs> but uh, Francesco, can you um, explain just in, in basic terms what the term actually mm -hmm. refers to? So, so for the R factor, I think the easiest way to think about it is um, if, in, if a person is infected, on average, how many other people will they infect? And, um, and the, the, the larger you can think about this maybe as a, if you have a completely uninfected population and it's very densely connected and you're able, and if you infect many other people and if many other people infect many other people, you get this cascading exponential effect. And, and we hear this term exponential growth all the time, but what this means is it uh, the one way of thinking about it is this kind of like, if you have a factor of two, is this doubling process. If you take a number like rabbits that are reproducing, they just double and double and double and double. In very few iterations, you have enough rabbits to cover the, the earth. And so this this is the type of, it's it's a method, method of way of quantifying how much that growth is. And so uh, we want to keep this R-naught value below one so that if you're infected on average, you infect less people or less than one. And this actually ends up being uh, a key measure of how you can keep the, the, the virus under control. 
I hope that's a, 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 a somewhat accessible. Yeah, that's a fantastic. <laughs> I will definitely use the rabbit analogy when I try to explain <laughs> the disease spread. <laughs> it's actually a fantastic analogy. You have one rabbit, it can give birth to one, can give birth to five. This is how you can predict the log um, or exponential growth uh, of transmission, uh, which is what we've been seeing in COVID. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll take this back to um, uh, Dr. Alpha. Um, so there's a question both that I, I actually plan to ask and also uh, it came from the audience. So we, we talked a lot about investment in healthcare structures, um, but what about investment in, in research capacity during the pandemic? Um, it's very tempting to, to move all the resources away from um, basic science and research just into operational funding, you know, funding the hospitals, funding the healthcare workers um, and um, uh, you know, it, it provides less incentives to actually invest in basic science. Um, so what are your thoughts on um, how governments can move um, on, on funding basic science um, or not necessarily basic, it could be translational, but moving into research as opposed to operational? I think he was offended by my question because he just left. <laughs> so, so um Dr. Janine, can you try to, to, to speak again, like just to see if, if you can take this question as well? Um, I know you have a lot of... Um, I'm back. Yes. Oh, Dr. Alpha is back. Okay, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, can no. you talk a little oh. bit about the investment in research in parallel to investment in uh, operational work? Sure. Um, yeah. I... Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Alpha. Okay. Bon, moi, je pense qu'il faut, il faut pas, d'une certaine façon, attendre la période de guerre pour préparer ce que j'aime dire souvent. Euh, la recherche fondamentale et opérationnelle nous permet d'obtenir des données pour soutenir dans ces conditions-là les décisions de santé publique. Et, euh, et ces recherches-là, il ne faut pas tout prendre en de santé pour euh, commanditer les travaux de recherche sur ce problème de santé et avoir des données. Il faut, à mon avis, que les gouvernements, les institutions qui ont les moyens de soutenir la recherche, le fassent à des problèmes. C'est-à-dire que pour, pour l'instant, on a, on a eu Ebola, on a eu euh, la maladie du coronavirus. C'est sûr qu'on aura d'autres épidémies dans le futur. C'est maintenant qu'il faut développer des travaux de recherche euh, permettant de comprendre les vaux, permettant de comprendre la biologie réelle de ces pathogènes, permettant de comprendre les, les, les facteurs sociaux, les facteurs de santé qui déterminent ce maladie pour, dans le futur, Donc, à mon avis, les gouvernements et les personnes qui financent la recherche ou les institutions qui financent la recherche ont tout intérêt à faire en sorte que euh, les travaux de recherche se mettent en place pour euh, et non pas pour servir euh, à ce à, à, dans cette façon de fonctionner pour être produit yeah thank you for that uh dr alpha so we um we shouldn't wait for a pandemic to invest in research um uh, obviously this this should be an ongoing investment uh so that we vaccinate our systems against the shocks of of pandemics um, I will try again with Professor Janine. Uh, can you try to speak, can you try to, speak um, to any of the uh, topics, to any of the topics on, the on the table? Let's see here. We can hear. Hi, can you hear me? Now? Can anyone else hear or is it just me? Earlier I saw in the chat that some people were able to hear actually, um, even though I, I, I can't hear from uh, I see not working. Can you someone in us? the audience can hear. Can you just like make a comment? Okay, I wanted just to say, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what is going on. Um, I wanted just to say that I think there's a lot that we need to do. 
Um, first of all, we need to do a quick assessment. We now have many countries are having mild coronavirus cases at home. I think we need to understand and to have a quick assessment on the state of, of infrastructure. Uh, when COVID started at some point, you can still hear me. Can you hear me now? Apparently, my voice. Okay, I'll just keep on on talk on saying about the infrastructure. We need also to put to set up a community surveillance system that is capable to detect, predict, and diagnosis and manage also COVID cases. So, in this regard, digitalization is the way to go. And lastly, I wanted to talk about the laboratory system that need to be uh, well strengthened and also communicated within or within the region and within the country. And, and also, I wanted also to talk about, um, you know, someone was talking about health and uh, universal health access. I think this is something that we are seeing with COVID, that if we, if our population is not protected, it's so hard for them to go even for COVID. We are seeing cases uh, in U.S. and many other countries where uh, if the access is still a problem, we, it's, there's no way we can fight this uh, pandemic over. I, I didn't want to interrupt Professor Janine, even though we can't hear her from this side, uh, but it appears that some of the people in the audience were able to hear her. Um, so if, if, if someone can, can add some of these points in the chat so we can incorporate them in the discussion, that would be great. Um, and thank you so much, Professor Janine. Um, so uh, moving on from investments and research, and we had a lot of uh, questions about that, but I think the panel has addressed it. Um, I think diagnosis is a really hot topic. Um, and um, it has been a major hindrance we heard today about pool testing, for example. Uh, but um, as we know, supply chain of, of many of the diagnostic technologies is a huge problem, uh, not just in Africa, but actually globally um, at this point. Um, so um, speaking from a very Afrocentric point of view, what do you think we can do to secure that supply chain of diagnostics and also invest in um, uh, research and development uh, so that we have a smoother um, uh, containment of, of viruses like bo uh, both Ebola and COVID-19. Um, so I'll, I'll direct the question uh, first to Francesco um, and then to Dr. Robert. Um, well, thank you for the question. And this is this is really important. And um, and, and this is work that uh, that we've been working on both actually in Mexico, where which is a similar scenario where very limited resources, the supply chain can be very fragmented. And we're beginning to work with in Ethiopia with, with Akhari as well. Um, but, but essentially the, the solution that, a possible solution that I would posit along the lines of our work is the, to indeed think about fixing some of these issues with the supply chain and, and resources that exist, but also possibly embrace the fact that resources are limited and use, and namely, then try to optimize the usage of resources given these limited constraints. And uh, to give you, and this is where pool testing, for example, is a fabulous resource. Um, and it's something that we've been working with extensively um, because essentially um, the, the, the question that we posit is say that, for example, you have a village of 10,000 people, but you only have a hundred tests available. And it doesn't even have to be a hundred tests available overall. Ultimately testing, it's important for it to be done quickly. There's no, it's of no use to learn a result of a test three weeks later. And so if you're ultimately only able to give say a hundred tests immediately, then the question is, what do you do with them? Um, who do you give them to? And especially if you can use pool testing, then you actually have a, a huge functionality available to you. And some of the possible solutions that are, um, well, it, it, I guess, innovative in a certain sense that we propose is to, for example, um, forego um, giving an individual diagnosis to, to people. Say if you, if you have 100 people, 100 tests and multiple people, then perhaps what you can do is just simply take group tests of the largest sizes. You might not necessarily know individually who has a virus amongst a positive group, but at the same time, you can you can tell all these people in the group, you know what, it could be the case that you have the virus, you are in a positive group, and then tell these people to self-isolate and increase the reach of a limited amount of tests. And, and, and how you do this, namely what group sizes you pick, um, where do you allocate tests in the population can be, again, formulated as an optimization problem. I mean, it could be the case if, if you're foregoing individual diagnosis, then public health professionals, for example, you don't want to necessarily put them into uh, doctors, for example, you don't want to put them in large groups where they might unnecessarily be told to self-isolate because they're it's or people with uh, very difficult socioeconomic means to self-isolate. 
these people you might want to put into smaller groups so that you mitigate the probability of them accidentally being told to self-isolate. At the same time, if you have, say, people who are working at a marketplace who meet many, many other individuals who are potential super spreaders, then you're probably going to want to say, for example, pack as many of those people as possible into groups because you want to cover that segment of the population and make sure that you don't, um, that an individual who has the virus doesn't go unnoticed. And, and all of these, uh, all of these interesting kind of non-trivial constraints to the problem um, they, they give rise to an interesting choice. And, and again, we can embrace the fact that these constraints exist and, and perform non-trivial testing. It, it's not immediately clear that you should just try to know everybody's diagnosis perfectly. This has worked for Korea, for example, or other places with extensive testing, but this is just not the reality in other places. And so we have to take a step back and rethink what we're trying to achieve with these limited resources. Dr. Robert? Okay, okay. So to add to Francesco's uh, uh, of, uh, contribution, and I might use your rabbit, uh, rabbit's uh, explanation for, I don't know, uh, and next time I'm explaining it somewhere too. Um, just to say that um, we, we must invest in solutions. And it's not only diagnostics, but in vaccines and, and, and other supplies. It, it's something that, that, that is important. Um, and these investments uh, we, we should be uh, public-private partnerships because these are areas in where the returns may not be immediate. I mean, you can be investing in, in these areas for a while before um, the returns come to it. So it should be government putting money uh, towards and supporting uh, uh, institutions that can do this. Sure. Um, uh, we're getting some feedback from uh, George and Mike. Okay, go ahead. Okay, yes, I was also going to speak about um, uh, just collaborations across the continent among the, 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 the various institutions on the continent where, where in the, the labs in, 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 in the regional laboratory hubs that we have, I think about five of them across the continent, um, and then the national laboratories as well to partner uh, with uh, the private sector in looking at how uh, these uh, diagnostics can, can be produced uh, across the continent and then also with ac the academia. So I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. This ties into your research question. There's a lot of research that needs to be, to be done and translated uh, into, into, into pro uh, production with a strong support from government and the private sector in investing uh, in, in these solutions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Alpha, do you have any additional comments on testing and, and new novel methods uh, like pool testing or other technologies um, to maximize uh, diagnosis capacity in Africa? Okay, voilà. Je, 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 je pense que ça peut être euh, une alternative sérieuse, par exemple, pour, euh, Les pays euh, qui n'ont pas beaucoup de moyens, les pays africains souvent, euh, le pooling dans les tests permet, permet, permet dans une certaine mesure euh, d'absorber un nombre important de personnes et de pouvoir réaliser des tests sur un grand nombre de personnes avec peu de réactifs. Donc je pense que c'est une technologie qui est à, à, à mieux mettre au point pour permettre de faire des résultats fiers à partir de, 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 de cette technique, mais également euh, euh, faire en sorte que le maximum de personnes puissent être testées. Donc, euh, il y a certains pays qui l'utilisent déjà, euh, des, des, des tests de mise au point sont en cours dans, dans certains pays, par exemple en Guinée, dont nous faisons. Uh, actually, in our laboratory, uh, the test of the new Some foreign thing out there, and what is yours local is not good enough. What is maybe foreign, and it kind of ties in a few points that have been made around creating local innovation that works for us, around creating tools that are ours. And I think just coming through the conversation, I think that's when we go back to saying there needs to be a culture shift. I think that's part of that. It's kind of valuing what we have and kind of seeing, you know, kind of realizing even those global powers
can face the same problems as us. I think that's one thing COVID has highlighted, that no one is above all of these things, you know. Um, uh, and there are some African countries that have done much better than some of, you know, the, the global superpowers. So I think hopefully this kind of shows us that, you know what, no one will always have the answers. We can also be our own, have our own solutions. Yeah. So just I wanted to agree with, with, with all of you and kind of say that that's yeah. kind of stuck out for me. Uh, Absolutely. Point. Absolutely. Um, I see a, a question just just came up. Um, so how do we how do we con invoke confidence in our cap capabilities as African countries in terms of creating or developing educational system that respond to our context? Why do we always look outside for any systematic solution to our challenges? I think that's what we were just talking about. <laughs> uh, but I wonder if uh, David, is there anything that you would like to add there? Yes. Um, what I would like to add there is. Um, as a continent, uh, there are challenges, but uh, there are opportunities. 